Hey gang, and welcome back to another Worksheet Solutions Walkthrough for the worksheet, Intro to Alkenes, Physical Property and Some Reactions. Okay gang, so if you're here, that means you are pressing into the wonderful world of alkenes. You've probably watched some alkene related videos on Geochem. You looked at the worksheet and maybe you're here for some deeper explanation. You've seen some problems, you saw the answers, but you want to know how A went to B. Well, you're in the right place. We're gonna step through this worksheet. We're gonna talk about why the things happened on the worksheet and how the answers were arrived at and have some fun. In problem one, we have letter A and B. So if we take a look at letter A, all we are tasked with doing is ranking the following four structures from one to four in terms of boiling point. And let me just make sure it is four being the highest boiling point, one being the lowest boiling point. So remember, gang, when we think about boiling point, we are thinking the strength of intermolecular forces, the forces between molecules, okay? So remember, those are things like dispersion forces, those are things like dipole effect, hydrogen bonding, if applicable, right? So if we take a look here, when, because this is purely an out, you know, the only thing we have going on here is we have double bonds as far as the functional groups in the, uh, you know, the four mo molecules given. We're dealing with dispersion forces, but remember, we also talked about how with um, a tie in terms of molecular weight, right, being dispersion forces, cis versus trans, tr uh, cis double bonds kind of can create a little bit of a dipole effect. So if we take a look here, right, clearly we have four carbons, one, two, three, four, five carbons, four carbons, five carbons, right? So we have, so the, clearly the five, uh, the two structures with five carbons will be, they will have a higher boiling point than these two right here. So one of these has to be one, one of them has, to, the other one has to be two. So if we take a look here, remember when we talk about cis double bonds, there's more negative charge kind of built up at this section of you know, this side, if you will, of the molecule and a little bit less right here, relatively speaking. So there's a slight dipole effect here. You can say slight, remember with cis, there's a slight dipole effect. So that's for cis, double bonds. So because that is an extra molecular force, this is the lowest boiling point. This comes in second. And again, if we take that same logic to the five carbons where there's a you know tie for molecular weight, this comes in third. This comes in fourth. So the cis double bonds have the edge, breaks the tie because of that extra little dipole effect right there. Okay, so then in letter B, we are tasked with, uh, I've exposed one hydrogen, and we need to circle the structure that has the more acidic hydrogen. Now remember, right, so you're probably thinking, Joe, we did this in Gen Chem, why is it coming back? Well, because we're about to look more specifically at alkenes and alkynes, so this is a related topic, right? Which is good because we already know it. So remember, this is a hybridization thing. Yeah, sorry, writing the whole thing out. Oh, there we go. So remember, things that uh, you know have more S character are more acidic, right? In terms of you know hydrogens, because the conjugate base of this structure, right, would have an electron pair in a, you know residing in an orbital with more S character because. It, the more S character you have, the closer that uh, orbital is to the nucleus and what lives in the nucleus, protons, and that helps stabilize the electron pair that has just been dumped by something abstracting a proton. So if we look here, right, this is an sp2 carbon. So because sp2 has more uh, S character than sp3, more acidic hydrogen is right here in this molecule, right? We have sp versus sp2, so right there. And then last but not least, sp versus sp3, and remember, Although I'm a bad artiste, make sure when you're drawing your SP stuff that it's linear, right? Don't just let all that hard work we put back in in Gen Chem as far as geometry and all that stuff go out the window because we're only be drawing more triple bonds to come. Okay, gang, that is problem one. Let us move on to two. In problem two, again, going down that kind of memory lane where we've done these, uh, you know, these types of reactions, they're old hat as far as E2 and the E1 mechanism for the dehydration of alcohols with you know sulfuric acid and heat. But again, they form alkenes, right? They form double bonds in our products, and we are kind of easing into you know the world of alkenes. So it's it's good review and it's easy because we already know it. So if we take a look here, remember, right? This is uh, getting the E2 E1 juices you know flowing again. Remember, this is just a simple E2 reaction because we have a tertiary substrate, we have a good leaving group in Br, which is Br minus, 
right? Weak, stable, conjugate base. And if you forgot all that, I'm sure you recognized T-butoxide, our big bulky base, too bulky to do substitution, right? In this case, we're tertiary, so we're only doing elimination, but it is our good, well, you know, what, one of our two go-to um, E2 bases. So we would, of course I put my black marker away already, and I needed it, but we have a bunch of equivalent positions, but we know we're going to abstract to a neighboring proton, form a double bond, kick off the leaving group all in one motion for bonus points, not really, but if you remember it, good for you. And we will make isobutylene bonus points if you do that common name. Okay, so moving down here, this is going to be dehydration reaction. Remember, this is an E1 mechanism. So we need to be wary of methyl and hydride shifts. My advice to you, anytime you have a mechanism that involves a carbocation, draw that in the margin of your paper. You want to see what that initial carbocation looks like, and then you can evaluate, will this shift? I, biggest piece of advice I can give you for these types of problems. So remember, this will get protonated to water. It will then leave. So that initial carbocation is going to look like this. It's a secondary carbocation like that. I'll move over a little bit. And you have to freeze and think to yourself, can I improve this carbocation? And the answer is yes, we can do that through a hydride shift. And again, you don't have to draw the mechanism in the margins. I think it just helps though to jot a little bit of mechanistic stuff down or, you know, maybe if you just even do this and just know, okay, this secondary carbocation is going to move to the tertiary position because if you try to do this in your head, you know, it could, I mean, if you're that comfortable with the reactions, please feel free to do that, but it can get hairy very quickly. So this is what we'll shift to. That's not the final product, right? I just, you know, I ran out of space over here. Um, remember, this makes an out, this is an E1. So we will form, you know, for this reaction, the most stable double bond. That's going to be this double bond right here between the two tertiary carbons, which we can do because we shifted. But remember, I'll put this in parentheses, it helps to draw initial, an initial carbocation, see if it's going to shift, then finish off your product, right? Okay, so down here. I'm not a giant, I'm not super proud of this problem, but my, my point of tossing it in was, I don't know, I guess I was trying to be cute in that I wanted to remind you of the anti-periplanar requirement, right? This is going to be E2, secondary carbon, but LDA is just like T-butoxide in that it's super big, super bulky. You're going to do elimination as long as you have a good leaving group. You have two viable options here, so really there's two products here. And because, because the anti periplanar requirement is satisfied because the chlorine's down, you have two hydrogens that are up. They're both the same. Remember, this would be a Hoffman product. Um, there's no difference between these two positions as far as you know, how substituted their carbons are. So if you look on the worksheet, the product is this. There's a double bond going this way, as well as a double bond going this way. Just a product mixture. If you were questioning, you know, me wondering why this problem was there, it's not the best problem I've ever written. Sorry. Okay, last one, a problem I do like down here is, again, it's an E, so this was E2, not that you had to identify this, but this is E1 up here, you know, save myself some space. So remember, it's going to be very helpful to draw the initial carbocation you get. So remember, this will, this OH will be protonated to water, it will leave. Okay? So, and I'm going to, actually work over here. So the initial carbocation we have looks like this. And will it make sense to shift the secondary carbocation over here to be secondary? No. We have a quaternary carbon next door. So while then we can't do a hydride shift, we can absolutely do a methyl shift. We will, uh, I'm going to draw this up here. We can have now we have this carbocation. I know it looks weird because you have a methyl group move over and then you take that quaternary carbon down to a tertiary carbon and then it loses, you know, it lost a bond. So it's a positive charge. So we will be making this double bond right here. That's the most substituted double bond we can make. So the product you get looks like that. Okay. That is two. We just have three to finish off this worksheet. So let's finish strong and let's keep going. Okay, gang, to finish out this worksheet in problem three, finally we hit some new, you know, material. So, 
you know, stuff we haven't done previously. So if we take a look here, we have four complete the reaction questions, and it's all about the hydrogenation of double bonds. So remember, and, and coming up, you're gonna get a lot of reactions, you're gonna have to remember lots of characteristics, I'm gonna call them, or properties of those reactions. You know, is it a syn addition, is it an anti, is it an anti addition? Um, you know, are you, you have to remember mechanistically, are there, is this prone to rearrangements? Is, uh, is it not prone to rearrangements and stuff like that? So this is the first of many, and it, don't, that's not meant to be scary, it's meant to be like, you're very smart, capable people, and you're gonna be able to remember all of them, but this is the first of a bunch. So, to take a look here, Remember, when you hydrogenate a double bond, you're gonna see hydrogen or maybe some type of isotope of hydrogen like deuterium or even tritium, and you will basically force hydrogen, you know, an H here and an H here across a double bond. It's going to hydrogenate it and take it down from a double bond to a single bond. Okay, so in this scenario, we can just go ahead and draw this, and I'm going to initially draw this like this, the, in the answer, it's not listed as this because it's not necessary. But remember, this reaction is what is known as a syn addition, meaning you're going to add two things on the same side of the molecule when you add them. I happen to draw them as two wedges, but there's no preference that where these, if these hydrogens will come on top of the molecule or from, you know, from the behind the board and attach. So you would get an even amount of reaction that's going to be wedge wedge and dash dash, you're going, to get, you're going to get no dash wedge. The reason why we don't have to specify this in this answer though, is because there's no stereochemistry here, right? There's no stereo, like there's already, there are, I keep putting my, the black marker away, but these, this structure starts out like hydrogen, hydrogen on the sp2 carbons. So when we add two more hydrogens, there's, we're not, a you know, we're not chiral at those centers. We're not attached to four different things. So you can go ahead and just leave it like that. Just wipe away the double bond. The, you know, that's what matters to get this, that first problem correct. However, taking the exact same structure, but creating something that we don't draw implicitly in organic chemistry, right? Namely, that being deuterium or tritium, right? This is just hydrogen with three neutrons, not two, deuterium, right? D2 is high, you know, hydrogen gas, but with uh, you know, the, at the hydrogen atoms have two neutrons. So in this structure, right, I'm going to draw the regiochemistry first. We absolutely would have this and, you know, you would have your, your hydrogens there. However, right, we need to reflect that this is a syn addition. We have this information. It's the situation where it matters and we have produced stereocenters. So what you can do is draw a structure like this or like this. As long as you provide one of the two, you're fine. Or, you know, if you drew both, that's great, right? There's no preference for this T2 in this situation. I have seen problems where it does matter you know, whether it attaches on top or on bottom. So in this scenario, you could assume it's going to be a racemic mixture in that way. So if you really wanted to, you could draw both, or that plus an antimer, up to you. One should usually be fine. I've usually seen just one be okay. Um, but I would definitely, you know, draw both. Uh, and we will see later on in an example where you won't have the other, the enantiomer because there's some steric things going on. But I'm beating the point to death. What I'm trying to say is, you can have the same exact structure, but depending on what you're hydrogenating with, you might actually produce stereocenters and you will have to tell, show someone and illustrate, you understand this is a syn addition, okay? All right, cool. So now down here, what I usually do is, you know, if it's hydrogen like that, I just think to myself, okay, this is probably going to just be a regiochemistry thing I need to worry about, right? Um, you're just gonna be forcing hydrogen on this position and on this position, neither of which are stereocenters, that totally works as a product, good and done. Now down below, oh, and I forgot to write excess. So the reason I included this, and I almost thought about making this a deuterium problem with D2, but I wanted to make sure that you saw one like this. We technically have two moles of double bond here. So you would need at least, or two equivalents if you want, you know, two moles, two equivalents, whatever, whatever works, I'm writing EQ. 
So you need at least two equivalents of H2 gas to make this work. But if someone writes excess, you can just assume anywhere you can hydrogenate on a structure, go ahead and do it. So this will just take your, your diene, your structure with two double bonds, down to just regular cyclohexane. Okay, gang, thank you for rocking uh, with me on this short worksheet. I loved this part of organic chemistry when I did it, so there's so much fun reactions to come. I think it's really going to show you how everything we kind of spent learning uh, in isolation is all going to come together and play with each other, and it's super cool when all of that comes into play because then you see all the fruits of your hard work and you remember things that you honestly probably thought you may have forgotten. So, But the point being, if you're watching this video, you've financially supported Joe Chem, um, and I hope that if you've been looking for answers and watching these videos that you found them and that... Uh, you know, I'm so happy and humbled you're using Jochem to help you crush Ochem. So thank you for using the website. I hope it's been the tool you hoped it was. Uh, I'm so happy you're using it right now. I hope you're using it toward the end of organic chemistry. But if anything, I hope to see you all in the next video.